Okay, let's go ahead and open up to Romans 9. This is a, a phenomenal chapter. It's very, very important chapter. It had to come here. We've looked at all those things before. Uh, God is showing us in Romans 9 his viewpoint of what's going on in the world. We got all our own viewpoints on what God ought to be doing or the way the world should be run or what, every, what the, he should be doing. But here in Romans 9 and 10 and 11, he's explaining what he is actually doing today. A critically important thing because uh, if you don't understand this, that simple basic question, what happened to the nation of Israel, then you're not going to understand anything about what God's doing today. If you think God has permanently cast away Israel, as what most of historic Christianity has in fact said, well, then uh, you're going to uh, basically have to come out a door that says God is unfaithful, God's unrighteous, God's uh, untruthful. And so, and that's even Paul's critics, God and Paul's critics, back when Paul wrote this, that's what they were saying. They were trying to make Paul say what most of historic Christianity says because they know that would make God unfaithful and unrighteous. And of course, that would be impossible. Therefore, Paul must be wrong. That's what they're getting at. Uh, that's what's driving this whole thing. He's given us all kinds of promises in Romans 8 as members of the church, the body of Christ. He's talking about our sonship position. He says we we're, uh, can never be separated from God and his love. And then you could go back into chapter 7 or chapter 6 and chapter 5 and chapter 4 and chapter 3. And he's just piling up the promise, promise, promise. But... He breaks in here. He talks about justification in chapters 1 uh, and th uh, into chapter 5. He talks about sanctification in chapters 5 through 8, what God does with those he justifies today, and that's place them in the body of Christ. And then he introduces the topic of glorification in chapter 8, and he stops because he has to answer this question. He's listed out all these promises, and they're promises that God, in a similar promises to what God had promised to Israel. And he has to answer this question, because if God has permanently cast away Israel, if he's broken his promises to her, he's not going to keep his word to her, he's gonna take them away from her and give them to somebody else, if the body of Christ has replaced Israel, well, that would make God unrighteous and unjust and untruthful. He would cease to be God. And in chapter 9, Paul drives his home point home because the whole thing he's going to get at is what most of historic Christianity denies. God hasn't permanently cast away Israel. It's only temporary. One day, and that's where we are in our passage in Romans 9 today, uh, God's going to restart his program with Israel. Yes, in chapter 9, he, he explains uh, that Israel had similar promises to what God has promised the body of Christ. They have, he promised them a sonship position. Just in chapter 8, he talks about our sonship position. He promised them that nothing could separate him, that nation, from himself. He said that in the end of chapter 8, nothing can separate the body of Christ. And us as members in that body of Christ from God and his love. He makes these promises over and over. And if he broke his promises to Israel, then why would we think? Why would we get any hope? Why would we get any comfort? Why would we get any encouragement? Because if he broke his promises to Israel, he could just as easily break his promises to us. That's why Paul drops in chapters 9, 10, 11. And in chapter 9, he explains that, yes, it's bad news for the nation of Israel because of their unbelief and rejection. God has cast away the bulk of the nation, but he's uh, preserved a believing remnant. And you know what the importance of that believing remnant is that they're going to record uh, what they were doing back, Peter and the 12, uh, and that believing remnant, they're going to they record their ministry at that time. And you know what God's going to do? Because he preserved that believing remnant, it's going to be super easy for him, really easy for him at some point in the future to start that believing remnant over again. They're gonna take 
the scriptures of that believing remnant, and they're going to begin with that. They're going to pick up right where the believing remnant of the first century left off, and he's going to fulfill his plan and purpose for the nation of Israel. So it's bad news for Israel, but there's good news too. The good news is that God, and now instead of coming back in his wrath and judgment to destroy his enemies, instead is using Israel's unbelief, Israel's unfaithfulness, Israel's unrighteousness as an opportunity to display his uh, mercy and grace and compassion and kindness and goodness and long suffering. Instead of coming back in his wrath and judgment, he comes back in his grace and peace. And it, while he's operating in grace and peace, he's going to fulfill another purpose that Israel didn't know anything about. Nobody knew anything about it. Not even the angels knew anything about it. God, the triune Godhead, came up with this program, this purpose and program, and eternity passed. They wrote it down on the parchment of heaven, and then they carried it down before creation of anything. Uh, they took it down to the deepest, darkest, strongest vaults of heaven, put it in there, twirled the lock, and they left that there, a mystery program. And now what God's doing today at the stoning of Stephen, he went back down to the vault, opened it up, and he brought out this mystery program that he'd kept secret since the, be since the beginning of the world. And he revealed it to Paul, and Paul has now revealed it to us through his scriptures, through the Holy Spirit and his scriptures. That's what he's doing today. He's being, law, as Peter and uh, Paul say, he's, it's the riches of his long suffering. He's enduring with much long suffering. The vessels of wrath, those who were his enemies. Uh, and he's calling out now individuals and you treating them as mercies, uh, vessels of mercy, putting them on his potter's wheel. He's manipulating them, guiding them with his hands, the gospel of grace uh, and the good news of the death and resurrection for them. And when they respond in faith, he takes them off the wheel and he puts them in his vessel of honor, the body of Christ. And he takes each person born into the world. We're all born into the world as ungodly sinners on enemy status before him. He confronts them with his gospel. And when they respond in faith, he puts them in the body of Christ. When they respond in unbelief, he puts them back in the vessels of wrath. And he goes through. That's what he's doing today. He's giving an out to the whole world. And he's been doing that for 2,000 years, give or take a few years and he's been carrying that out and one day he's going to take that vessel of honor the body of Christ and he's going to take that with its vessels of mercy and he's going to put it up in the museum of heaven and the display cabinet of heaven shine a light on it and display his glory through it for the whole universe to see that's what he's doing today that's why he hasn't come back and, and removed all evil and all wickedness and all sin and all that. Because when he comes to do that, he's going to do it completely. And that leads into now our next section here. So let's pick it up at verse 25. Uh, and let's just begin to think about this. We get God's viewpoint here on what's going on in the world. Israel's fallen predicament. Here's the basic bottom line. Is the way God remains God, the way God remains faithful and just and righteous, is that what Paul's teaching is that God has cast away the nation of Israel only temporarily. And now he's going to, in verses 25 down through 28 and 29, he's going to explain it's going to be super easy for God to restart his program with Israel. He's not going to have any problem with that. And he's going to go through some reasons uh, why that is. Uh, and it's important for us to see here that the only way God would be unfaithful and unrighteous would be if he never returned to his prophetic program with the nation of Israel. But he will it's going to be really easy. And he gives a couple examples here. Let's pick it up at verse 25. Verse 25, as he saith also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, 
which was, not, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. And the main thing that you uh, need to see here, this comes right out of the section on the vessels. He has vessels of honor. Israel had been a vessel of honor. We could take as an example, perhaps, uh, the reigns of uh, King David and Solomon, at least in the early part of the reign of King Solomon. They were a vessel of honor. They were turned into a vessel of honor. They became that great nation. The Gentiles came to, to get their knowledge and to come worship the Lord there and all that. He, they were a vessel of honor. But then because of their un, unbelief, they went into those courses of punishment, especially that fifth course of punishment, and they became vessels of dishonor. And God handed them over to the Gentiles. And what uh, Hosea is, is saying here is that he can turn Israel, just as, he, just as Israel was a vessel of honor, and then it be, got, he considered her a vessel of dishonor, uh, and he can just as easily start considering her a vessel of honor again. And he's going to do that through that believing remnant. Hosea spoke of a time when Israel would be accursed, uh, not, that's just what not his people means. How did chapter 9 open up? He announced the fact uh, that the nation of Israel was now a curse, separated uh, from Christ. Uh, they're in a cursed situation. And uh, Hosea talked about this. This would have been hundreds of years before this. And there were times when it, the nation of Israel uh, was not uh, under a curse. There was a time when they were under a curse. And now, uh, there's, it'd be very easy for God to go and uh, to remove them from being under a curse again. It just goes in. He can, they've been these things before, Paul says. He's using that history to explain why what, what God's doing today with the nation of Israel is nothing unusual. It's, it's in line with what he's done in the past. So Hosea speaks of a time when Israel would be a curse, not his people, but God would not leave them there. He would return them to himself and make them his people once again. Hosea, let's go over to Hosea 2. I think last week we looked at Hosea 1, but let's go to Hosea 2 this time. Hosea, if we can find it. I usually put bookmarks in this. But I didn't this time. But here we go. Hosea, it's right after Daniel. Hosea 2.23. Hosea 2.23. All right, let's pick it up here. Uh, remember Hosea? Uh, we were talking about this a little. We introduced this a little bit last week. Uh, we looked at the first chapter last week. Remember, uh, they're going to do a. Prof God wants Hosea to do a prophetic enactment, not just give a verbal message. He wants to actually act out what how God views his relationship with the nation of, in, in, of the nation of Israel, and he views it as one of adultery. It's an adulterous revel, uh, 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 relationship. They had turned to idols. They were worshiping over their idols. They brought other gods into his, their relationship. And God has Hosea now go find an adulterous wife, a, a, a prostitute, uh, and marry her. And then he starts giving his children names according to that. And one of those names is, you know, they're not my people. Now they are my people. Now they're not my people. Then they will be my people. It's the same thing Paul's talking about here. The vessels, they're a vessel of honor. And then based on their response to the, the hands of the potter, uh, the word of God, uh, they become a vessel of dishonor. But when they respond on the basis of the guidance of the word, uh, the hands of the potter, the word of God, he can just as easily turn them back into a vessel of honor. He can turn them back into his people. He can make them again his beloved. Hosea 2. So with that in mind, let's look at a different uh, verse here that says something kind of similar to that. Hosea 2. Oh, let's pick it up. Uh, verse 19. Hosea 2, verse 19. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. See, now he just got done explaining to her why she, he, she was going to set her aside. He's going to go put a divorce against her uh, and, and not be betrothed to her. Now in chapter 2, he's going to explain, and then there's going to be a time when I become betrothed to her again. 
and he says here, verse 18, or verse 19, I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. And it shall come to pass in that day, I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens and they shall hear the earth and the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil and they shall hear Jezreel and I will sow her unto me in the earth and I will, remember they're still talking about Israel here, I will have mercy upon her that I, I had not obtained mercy and I will say to them which were my people, this is what Paul quotes, they aren't my people, not my people, they are my people, and they shall say, thou art my God. Paul's point in bringing this whole, referring back to this whole situation, is what God's doing in his day in setting aside the nation of Israel, casting her aside. Uh, she's gone from a vessel of, of honor, let's say in the reigns of David and Solomon, she became a vessel of dishonor in the Babylonian captivity, the Assyrian and Babylonian captivities when she was removed from the land and taken out among the Gentiles. Romans 2, Paul says in Romans 2, explains that uh, they were a dishonorable vessel at that time and still in his own day. And at the stoning of Stephen, they became a vessel of wrath. He just placed them. All the other nations of the world had already uh, rebelled against God and he'd cast them away as vessels of wrath. He's created his own nation, the nation of Israel. And she, instead of following God, she followed them. And she went from a vessel of honor to a vessel of dishonor. And at the stoning of Stephen, when she finally refused to have the Lord Jesus Christ be her king and Messiah, they became numbered among the Gentile nations. And they just became another Gentile nation, a vessel of wrath. But what God is, what Paul and God are bringing out here is it's, it's just a temporary thing. Look what Hosea says way back in time, and the whole same thing holds true for Paul over in Romans 9. He says in verse 23, I will sow unto her unto me in the earth. He's going to take that believing remnant. He's going to deliver it out of that uh, tribulation period, bring his people into the land, plant them in the land, make of them the nation of Israel. And she'll be her uh, the nation of Israel. They'll be God's own, very own nation. And it says, "I uh, and I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. She was uh, didn't have mercy, and now she's going to have mercy. She had mercy at one time. Then she, because of her unbelief, she didn't have mercy, and one day she'll have mercy again, and she'll be brought into the land, planted there, and God will make." that uh, nation and fulfill all his promises to the nation of Israel. At the look at the end of verse 23, and I will say to them, which were not my people. See, uh, even in Hosea's day, they were already not gonna be his people. He's gonna send them off to the Gentiles. Paul's saying he's, God's doing something like that in his day, in Paul's day. He's cast them away. Uh, he's set them aside. He's doing something else. It's not his people, but one day it'll be very easy for God when that vessel of Israel begins, he puts it on the potter's wheel and starts spinning and, through, and in response to the guidance of his hands, the word of his mouth, uh, she responds in faith and she'll become a vessel of honor again. She'll become his people again. She'll become uh, a vessel of mercy again as the nation as a whole and uh, it will be very easy for God to do that so Hosea spoke of a time uh, when Israel wasn't what there was a time when Israel was a vessel of honor and then wasn't then and will be again in the future it's no big thing for God he can restart his program with Israel is Paul's point now let's go let's look at another one let's look at Isaiah uh, let's read go back to Romans 9 and look at his section on Hosea. Uh, in Romans 9, let's pick it up at verse 27. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel. So here we have Isaiah. He's also crying uh, out something about Israel. 
And he says, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, where'd you, where uh, was that promise given? That's that Abraham, a Abrahamic covenant, right? Uh, he says in a few different ways, it'd be in number of Israel, it'd be as the sand of the sea, as the dust of the earth, as the stars in the sky. They're gonna be an innumerable group of people. But look what Isaiah said in his own day. This goes back, He's not Isaiah obviously isn't talking about what, what's happening in Paul's day, he's talking about what's happening in his day. And look what it says here, Isaiah also cried concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, that's God's promise, a remnant shall be saved. See, there's always a believing remnant. And how does Romans 9 begin? He's gonna talk about that believing remnant remnant. He's preserved a believing remnant and he even though the number of the believing remnant is very very small he can without any problem recreate the nation out of that some very small believing remnant recreate the nation so that the nation will be innumerable Isaiah cries that out, uh, and look how he's going to uh, finish this, verse 28. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will, be the, will the, uh, the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, he had been, we had been as Sodom and as like unto Gomorrah. And that's... Uh, what we're going to look at, especially tonight here, uh, is the next thing he's going to bring up. Here's a believing rem remnant, uh, so it's going to be no problem for God to create the nation and have her, an innumerable seed of Abraham uh, running the world, the members of that nation. There's always that believing remnant. Let's go over to Isaiah t uh, 10. Uh, Isaiah said that even in their accursed state, he would always preserve a remnant through which he would bring Israel back to himself. Let's go over and just look at one example of this, Isaiah 10. Isaiah 10, verse 20. Remember Isaiah? It's, he's uh, writing way back. Uh, he's before even the Assyrian captivity. Uh, and so it's always good to go to these prophets. Don't go to these prophets. Read this and, and put in Chicago or Los Angeles or San Francisco or, you know, you see a judge, something bad goes on somewhere and you think, oh, this is one of the judgments like in Isaiah. He's not talking anything about what's going on in the world today. God's not dealing with nations today. God's not dealing with his prophetic program. He, you come here, you just look at that timeline. I, I think I have it up here, but I won't go back to it. I think we're all familiar with it. Uh, and when you look at that timeline, you'll know exactly, knowing where Isaiah starts, he's before the Assyrian captivity. Uh, knowing that, you'll, you know what Isaiah is going to be talking about. He's going to talk about the condition of the people in his own day. Then he's going to talk about the Assyrian captivity. And you can actually take uh, the larger blocks of Isaiah and you can put them right in order. And he just works his way through. He talks about the, the state of the people in his day. Then he goes on to the Assyrian captivity. That's the next thing on the, on the timeline. Then he goes to the Babylonian captivity. Then he goes to Medo-Persia. Then he goes to 400 years silence and Gentile rule. Then he goes to the earthly ministry of Christ. Then he goes to that tribulation period. Then he goes to the kingdom. And you can break down the whole book of Isaiah in major sections based on which of those things are emphasized. All of them are talked about throughout, but there's large blocks of information uh, as you work your way through Isaiah. That's what he's talking about. Don't insert anything from the dispensation of grace into here. Uh, don't manipulate people by trying to show this is what God's doing to sinners now and, and all the things that you hear on the TV news and things like that. That's not what Isaiah is about. So let's go to Isaiah 10, verse 20. And here he's looking at this Jew, the Jewish remnant, the remnant of Israel, 
especially during this great tribulation period. Verse 20, and it shall come to pass in that day, that's always a, 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 a indicator of what time he's talking about, in that day or in the last day, uh, days, that refers usually out to that tribulation and on into the kingdom kind of time frame. And he says here, in that day, that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon, upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. That's from our Matthew study, that's that believing remnant, especially once it's picked up again in that tribulation period. That's what the ones, they're not going to be reliant like the Israel of old, unbelieving Israel, who went to the Egyptians and went to other nations to try and rely on, uh, and they all fell. This believing remnant's going to rely on God. The old Israel, the past and unbelief, relied on uh, the gods of the Gentiles for nothing. And out there, the that believing remnant is going to be relying, as it says here, on the one true God upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. The remnant, verse 21, shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty. It's going to be a very small remnant. They're going to, he's going to call them back to the land. Verse 22, for though thy people, Israel, be as the sand of the sea, this is what uh, Paul is quoting from, yet a remnant of them shall return, and uh, the consumption decreed shall overflow, uh, for the Lord God of hosts shall make a consumption, even determined in the midst of all the land. There's going to be the horrible judgments uh, that come at this time, purifying that believing remnant. And once it comes out, Remember those baptisms of John? You had the, when they repented, when they believed the gospel of the kingdom, they were justified unto eternal life uh, forevermore before the tribunal of God. God places them in that believing remnant. Then they go and they participate in Israel's national repentance and uh, national cleansing program. And the three uh, steps in that cleansing program are the water baptism of John, that's the first step, the spirit baptism, which they were introduced to at Pentecost, and then out there at the end of that tribulation, that fiery baptism, that baptism of fire, and it's going to purify that believing remnant. Now, when Christ returns, they're going to be a pure believing remnant, and he's going to usher them into that kingdom. He's going to plant them in the land, that very small remnant, and he's going to make, recreate from them the nation of Israel, uh, form, and they'll be as numerous as the sand of the sea. Verse, 22, uh, verse uh, 24, Therefore, saith the Lord God of hosts, uh, O oh, my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. For yet a very little while, remember that, we're going to run into that again. For a very little while and the indignation shall cease and mine anger in their destruction. And the Lord of hosts, that's our Lord of Sabaoth, we'll be back in this passage a little later, or, or some other passages like this, shall stir up the scourge. Uh, let's just go down to verse 27. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from his shoulder and his yoke from his neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Now, we, there's so many details we could go in there. The main point I'm just trying to bring out is that God just needs a very small remnant of the nation of Israel, of the people of Israel, that believing remnant. It's the remnant of faith. Remember how Romans 9 opens up? Not all that men see is that calls itself Israel, all that men call Israel, that's not what God sees as Israel. All Israel isn't true Israel. All Israel are all those who come from the line of Abraham th uh, through the, the, his progeny Isaac and Jacob. But that's not the Israel God sees. Isra or God sees the Israel that, yes, comes from the natural progeny of Abraham through the line of Isaac and Jacob, but God has a second prerequisite. 
They have to follow in the footsteps of Abraham, and that's the footsteps of faith. Those are the ones that make up. That's that believing remnant. He's going to be able to take that believing remnant. It doesn't matter if it's very, very small. He's going to be able to take that believing remnant and turn it into the nation of Israel and fulfill his promise that her inhabitants would be as the sand of the sea, as the stars of the sky, as the dust of the earth. It's no problem for God. He can take Israel, who is now a vessel of dishonor, a vessel of wrath, and he can make her into a vessel of honor again. Or he can, in a vessel of mercy. If right now, they're a very small, believing remnant. He can take them and turn them into a mighty nation. It's going to be no problem for God. God hasn't cast away the Israel permanently. Yes, she's a vessel of dishonor, a vessel of wrath at this time. Yes, she's, uh, God only views it as a believing remnant. So it's a very small remnant of what calls itself uh, Israel. But those, are, those won't inhibit God from fulfilling his plan. He can uh, just change the way he deals with Israel, make her a vessel of honor again, no problem. He can take that little believing remnant and turn it into a great nation. And he can do it with a great work. So let's go back to Romans 9. And let's look at the last, uh, really the last verse before he goes off in a little bit different direction in chapter 9. Go down to verse, uh, we'll pick it up on the Lord of Sabaoth, down to verse 29. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we'd been like Sodom and made like unto Gomorrah. Uh, and actually, let's go back up a verse. We, I really should have started at verse 28. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. We just read that in, uh, in Isaiah 10, where he talked about that. We'll look at a couple other places. It's going to be a very short work, and it's, imp it's important to realize the contrast here in Romans 9. Look back at verse 22. Verse 22, he says, what if God, willing to show his wrath, he was willing to do it, and there was, came a time when Israel's rebellion against God in joining hands uh, with the Gentile nations in their rebellion against God, he was ready and willing to come back in his wrath and judgment and destroy all his enemies, beginning with Saul, the head leader of the uh, persecution against Christ, and then beginning in the house of Israel, and especially the Gentiles. Come back and destroy them. But look what he does, verse 22. And, he, and what did he do instead? What if God, willing to show his wrath, to make his power known, what did he do instead of that? He endured. And just take those vowels and add about 50 more U's in there, U's in that word. He endured with what much long suffering the vessels of wrath who had fitted themselves unto destruction because of their rebellion and unbelief. That's what he's doing today. That's what's been going on the last 2,000 years. He's been enduring with much, with the riches, he says in another place, the riches of his long suffering so that as many of his enemies could be saved. Instead of coming back in his wrath and judgment and destroy Saul and clear out the house of Israel and especially the Gentiles removing all his enemies, you know what God did? what the Lord Jesus Christ did, he came back and he saved his worst enemy, Saul, made him our apostle Paul, sent him first to the Jews and especially the Gentiles, not in his wrath and judgment, but in his grace and peace, so that as many as possible of his enemies could be saved and removed from the, the earth, the target of the, of the weapons of heaven, all the weapons of heaven are pointed down on, remove them from the earth before the coming destruction. That's a long work. Put about 400 million O's in there. God is now being long 
suffering. He's putting up with evil. He's putting up with sin. He's putting up with wickedness. Uh, he's putting up with all that so that his enemies might be saved. But there's something he's going to do that he, and it's going to now be cut short. It's going to be a very short work. And that's what we pick up in verse 28. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. It's going to be a very short work. So here we have another reason. Why has it been so long? You know why it's been so long is that uh, God is being long suffering with people not just with people like Hitler and the Hitlers and Stalins, people like you and like me and your neighbor and your coworker and your friends and your relatives, all those who have thus far rejected Christ uh, and rejected God's word about what his son did on that cross for them. And he's giving them more time to respond in faith, long suffering, long suffering a time of mercy and grace for his enemies. And when this is over, it'll be a short time of wrath and destruction for his enemies. And someone last week very astutely brought out the idea uh, that uh, this short time of wrath is a mercy too. The long suffering for his enemies is being merciful, but it's also a mercy when he cuts short the time of destruction. He's going to end it. It's going to be quick uh, and thorough and complete. And that's what we want to look at now. And it's an act of mercy because even, he says at one point, even the elect wouldn't be able to withstand if it went on longer. And he cuts it short out of mercy and destroys all his enemies. So let's look at the verse, 20, uh, verse 29 now and look at this Lord of Sabaoth, uh, verse 29. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, a seed just a very small number, it's kind of the, re the whole remnant thing. We had been as Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. All right, this uh, Lord of Sabaoth, uh, the, it's, the Sabaoth there is not Sabbath. <laughs> I know I thought that for a while, many years ago. It's not to say, he's, not, he's talking about the Lord of the Sabbath like he does in the Gospel accounts. This is Sabaoth. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right in the Hebrew, but it's to differentiate it from the Sabbath. And it means the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, the Lord of battles, the Lord of war. See, now God's operating as the Lord of grace and peace. And he's doing that over a long period of time. He's going to come back, and in a very short period of time, he's going to come as the Lord of Sabaoth, the Lord of battles, the Lord of, of war. And he's going to destroy all his enemies, human and angelic. This is what Stephen saw in Acts 7, at the end of Acts 7 there. We, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, so we won't turn there again. But remember, Stephen's there. They're stoning him to death. This is the third time they've reached the climax of saying, we will not have this Jesus rule over us. We reject God's Messiah and King. We rebel against God. We won't have him rule over us. We reject him completely and totally, and they stone his spokesman, Stephen. Stephen looks up and the heavens open and there's Jesus, the Lord Jesus, uh, standing there uh, not to receive Stephen. Jesus could have received Stephen standing or sitting. Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wouldn't let him, uh, would have received him into heaven. That's not the point of him standing. Peter said he would stay seated until he was ready to make his foes, his enemies, his footstool. And still, he would stay seated until he stood up to trample his enemies underfoot. And now Stephen looks up, and there's the Lord Jesus standing. And he's in full war gear, full camouflage. He's got missiles under each arm. Now, you understand uh, God isn't going to use missiles. I'm using, speaking metaphorically. He's going to use, as someone else had mentioned in an email to me, the word of his mouth. <laughs> 
is going to be enough to destroy everything uh, and take care of his enemies. But to get the picture, he looks up into heaven and he sees uh, the, the warrior God as Jesus as the Lord Sabbath, the Lord of battles, and he's got his angelic hosts, and they're all armed to the teeth too, and everything's pointed down to earth. That's what Stephen saw. And Stephen just prayed his last words, uh, forgive them, don't hold this against them. And he didn't. And you know what God, what Jesus did there? Uh, he withdrew, the Lord of Sabaoth withdrew and decided to be the long-suffering Lord, the Lord of grace and peace. And he came back and saved his enemies, beginning with Saul, going first to the Jews in this transition period, and then especially for the Gentiles to save his enemies. To all rebels who reject this offer, the Lord will return. They'll have to face uh, not the Lord of grace and mercy. Of course, they're the same person, but not uh, the Lord in the role of grace and mercy. That's what he's doing now. They're going to face the Lord in his role as the Lord of Sabaoth, the Lord of, uh, of war, the Lord of battles. And it's going to lead to their destruction. All enemies. So let's look at the Lord of Sabaoth again. I put down a few little uh, things here just to show you. I want to bring out the shortness of this judgment, the shortness of how, and how it contrasts to the long suffering. Now we have the shortness. Let's go to Isaiah 1. Isaiah 1. <clears throat> and we're going to read something similar to what we read in Isaiah 10. But let's read it here in Isaiah 1. Isaiah 1, and we want verse 24. Isaiah 1, verse 24. Oh, let's remember where we are here. It's important. Isaiah is warning them. They're at the end of the fourth course of punishment. He's warning them. The northern kingdom is going to be carried off by Assyria. That's pretty much a done deal. Uh, but the southern kingdom, Judah, uh, is going to be, uh, has a chance of repenting and not be carried off by the Babylon, Babylonians. A little over 100 years later and that's the beginning of the fifth course of punishment they're in the f end of the fourth course of punishment he's appealing with them to change their mind repent and he won't bring the fifth course of punishment on them uh, and that's what he's he's getting at here that's what's ahead the next thing is the assyrian captivity then there's going to be the babylonian captivity and then the rest of that fifth course of punishment. And so look how he describes uh, the situation here. Let's go down and let's just pick it up at, um, oh, let's uh, begin at verse 23. This is Isaiah 1, verse 23. Thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Every one loveth gifts and follow after rewards. Uh, they judge not the fatherless, neither do they cause the widow uh, come unto them. And hopefully a lot of you, if you're involved in the Matthew study, you see a lot of similarities here, a lot of things we've already talked about in Matthew. Verse 24, therefore saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts. That's what, this is what Paul's quoting. This is the Lord of Sabaoth. And he says here, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel. Ah, I will ease me of my adversaries and avenge me of mine enemies. Go back to chapter 10, where we just were. Chapter 10, verse 25. And you get kind of the time element again. Uh, this is the same verse we read a few minutes ago, but let's just look at it since we're right here. Isaiah 10, verse 25. For yet a very little while, the indignation shall cease, and mine anger in their destruction, the destruction of his enemies. There we have that little time concept. Go over to uh, Zephaniah. Zephaniah. And uh, where is Zephaniah? Zechariah is just before Malachi. It's not that. It's right after Habakkuk. Zephaniah is right after Habakkuk, if that helps you. Uh, and look, go to chapter 1, verse 18. Chapter 1, verse 18. And it's important to remember that Zephaniah uh, now is a little later in the timeline. Isaiah was in the fourth course of punishment. 
Uh, now Zephaniah, he's, a, he's kind of uh, w close to in time to Jeremiah, they've actually entered the fifth course of punishment now. They've experienced that Babylonian captivity. So Zephaniah is going to start talking about things that happen after that. Uh, and that's what he's going to be referring to. But let's look at verse uh, 18. Uh, let's begin back a little bit. Let's go to verse 14. Verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near uh, the, and hasteth greatly. There you have that uh, speedy concept, that something cut short, happening quickly. And hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord, looking out at that tribulation period. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. The day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out on out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Verse 18 is where we really want to focus on now. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even, and here we have it again, that quick cut short uh, concept. And he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. So here, this Zephaniah is talking about this time, it's gonna be a very short work of total destruction. It'll be speedy in the land of Israel. Uh, this is going to uh, be out in the, it, Daniel's time schedule, especially the seven years in the, in the tribulation period, especially that last three and a half years, uh, and then the deliverance of that believing remnant. So it's gonna be speedy, it's gonna be quick and it's going to cover the land of Israel. But let's see if, if it just stops there. Go to Nahum now. Nahum is just before Habakkuk. Uh, Zephaniah was after Habakkuk, so if you're in Zephaniah, just go back to the other side of Habakkuk, and you'll have Nahum. Uh, Nahum um, was a prophet uh, who came after Jonah. He's a, over, a little over 100 years after Jonah, and he... Uh, He's Jonah, you remember Jonah, he went uh, to the Assyrian capital, Nineveh, and uh, they actually responded to his message. They, they received God's word to them. Uh, now it's about, uh, it's over a little over a hundred years later with Nahum, and he's going to give a prophecy about Assyria and, the, and Nineveh, and they've already left God a little over a hundred years later, and they've already turned from God, and Nahum gives a prophecy uh, regarding that. But now that prophecy is going to look out at that, those end time uh, things. So let's go begin a with that little bit of background, begin at chapter 1, verse 2. God is a jealous God, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, uh, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. So my point uh, in bringing this, this passage up is just to kind of keep, keep it in perspective is the last one, and Zephaniah was talking about especially the nation of Israel. Now he's gone out in this prophecy to a Gentile nation, and he expands it to how this destruction is going to uh, permeate and go out into the whole world. It's furious wrath. Verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger. We kind of like what Paul's talking about in Romans 9. He's now being long-suffering, but when his anger comes, uh, and he, the Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry and dries up the rivers and uh, the mountains quake at him. Verse 5, who can stand, verse 6, before him in his indignation and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. See how he's going back for that believing remnant, for the believers, he's going to be a stronghold. For his enemies, he's going to be destruction. 
fiery destruction. Uh, and he knoweth them that trust in him. Verse 8, but with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. Now we've gone, it's going to be quick, it's going to be sudden, it's going to uh, happen out of a short period of time, and it's going to not just be in the land of Israel, it's going to reach to the utter ends of the earth. It's going to be a complete purging of his enemies so that when he establishes that his kingdom on earth it'll be a righteous kingdom a holy kingdom uh, a, a kingdom uh, that's run according to his glorious plans and purposes so it's going to not only be short and quick it's not only going to be in the land of israel it's going to be to the utter ends of the earth and uh, we won't look at it here but we could go to matthew 24 22 and see but, and in Romans 9, for that matter, there's going to be a believing remnant that is saved out of this. And that's what uh, he's picking up in Romans 9. Paul's picking up on a Romans 9. Uh, th he's going to take that believing remnant. It's not going to be any problem for God to turn them into that great nation. God will do it. He'll re rid the earth of all those who have rejected his word with regard to the personal work his son on the on the coin on the uh, cross all right let's go back to romans 9. romans 9 <clears throat> romans 9 and uh, i think it's worth just mentioning uh, this I, you can think of it as a coin two sides to a coin there's two sides uh, to god's uh, coin the lord's coin on one side is the riches of his long suffering but the flip side of that is the shortness of his anger and wrath. But it's going to be not only short and quick, it's going to be thorough, it's going to be complete, it's going to be to the utter ends of the earth. Today, he's holding back that wrath and judgment. He's holding back the destruction of all his enemies. And he's instead extending them his grace and peace. And that's where we come now at the end of Romans 9 here. I, uh, well, uh, the rest, the next three verses, he kind of goes in a little different area. It's a conclusion. I'll call it a conclusion of chapter 9. Uh, so we kind of, are, if we wanted to summarize where we are in chapter 9 now, the conclusion would be, we're keeping everything in mind that we've talked about since the first uh, part of the chapter. When God completes this work among the Gentiles, and by this work I mean the work he's doing through the apostleship of Paul today in this dispensation of grace, this mystery program whereby he's creating a new group of people, a new vessel of honor called the body of Christ, through which he's going to display his glory in the heavenlies. Once that's complete, he will restart his program with the nation of Israel, his prophetic program with the nation of Israel, fulfilling perfectly and completely every promise he ever gave to her. And we're back at the beginning. We're back at why this chapter is here. He is not all done with Israel. Israel's been a vessel of honor, and then she's been a vessel of dishonor in the past, and God can just make her into a vessel of honor again. Uh, Israel's been reduced to just a very small believing remnant. That's no hindrance to God. He'll just take that believing remnant and turn it in, create from them the nation, and uh, their uh, nation will be like the, the inhabitants will be of the nation of the, uh, like the sand of the sea, the dust of the earth, the stars in the sky. None of that's going to be a hindrance to him. The main thing that he's doing today that uh, you should, we should keep in mind uh, before we wish for, all, for God to return, Christ to return, and remove all our problems and make our paths smooth, and remember that when that ends, that time of long suffering, the time now when we minister under adverse circumstances, the time now, the once in a time opportunity we have in all uh, eternity to uh, minister for for God, be God's ambassadors on enemy territory under adverse circumstances in a sin-cursed world under the control of Satan and death, 
when that ends, then for God, we're removed. Christ returns in his wrath and judgment. And it's going to be a speedy work. And it's going to be a, to the utter ends of the earth. That's another reason why it hasn't come yet. God is being long-suffering. His desire is that all might be saved. And now when we, we realize that, uh, we're back to where we began. Uh, God is not, this doesn't, Paul's ministry, unlike what most of historic Christianity has taught and preaches, Paul's preaching doesn't call into question God's character or God's nature. Uh, he is faithful, righteous, and truthful. Uh, it's only a temporary casting away, not a permanent casting away. God remains God, thank God. And all those promises Paul's and God have been given us in the first eight chapters of Romans are going to be, are, uh, gonna, we can be confidently sure God's going to carry them out. Just as he's going to carry out his promises to Israel down to the very last, littlest one, he's going to do the same thing with us. Therefore, the Romans are right to put their trust in such a God. Just as he will fulfill all the promises he gave to the nation of Israel, so too will he fulfill all the promises he gave to the body of Christ, uh, not the least of which being and what we've uh, covered in those first eight chapters of Romans. God remains God. What a wonderful thing. And that's why Paul's put this in here. God can remain God. It's not permanent. His casting away of Israel is only temper temporary. And then he's going to, so let's just introduce the next section in the last couple minutes here, and we'll see where we're going in the next section. Let's just read down, begin at verse uh, 30. Verse 30, what shall we say then, that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained unto righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So he's going to now address in the final uh, verses of chapter 9 as kind of a, a conclusion to chapter 9. He's going to explain how Israel got into this predicament, this accursed state. And he's going to uh, explain at the end of chapter 9 what Israel did in the past to uh, end up. And remember, this is 20 or 25 years after Pentecost, just 20, 25 years after the stoning of Stephen. This is uh, a, a couple decades later, at least. And, <clears throat> and he's going to explain how they got in this situation, what, what happened back at, the, at Pentecost, that first uh, early Acts period, transition in the early Acts period. What, how did Israel get in this fallen uh, predicament? And then in chapter 10, he's going to open it up and he's going to uh, lay a, a claim before Israel that they're still doing that. They're still doing the thing that they did that got them in this predicament. They're persisting in doing the same thing. And especially with Paul, what God's accomplishing through the Apostle Paul. They're doing the same thing. They're continuing. They haven't learned their lesson. And Paul's going to try and explain to them the lesson. What they did in the past to get in this position, they're still persisting. And now, even through his ministry and rejecting him in his ministry. And he's going to appeal to them to now uh, receive his ministry and God's ministry through him so that uh, they can be, so the individual Jews can be removed from the accursed nation and uh, be brought in to God's plan and purposes for today and be justified unto eternal life and made participants in God's pro mystery program for the body of Christ.
All right, and with that little bit of a nod to next week, an introduction to next week, we'll go ahead and close it, uh, close for tonight. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer.